You watched a tree fall when? Boom! Bam! Bam! And the brush movement was going towards me and Rebecca. Well, that crack was, I mean, it could have been, I guess if we went through here, maybe we touched a tree or something, but it was a, it, it was a pretty nice crack. I what would cause it? The members of the Olympic Project have been studying what they believe to be Sasquatch nests. From footprints to audio, their research efforts have resulted in various types of evidence being gathered, all the while trying different and new methods for data collection. I visited the nest area in 2023 with OP members Shane Corson, Chris Spencer, and Rebecca Slick. And as we began the process of moving from one campsite to another, I was introduced to one of their methods of data collection. So should we start taking stuff down? Yeah, I'm gonna go grab my camera, and then we can... Where is your camera, sir? Film you? If you want, it's back side of this hill. It's not too far, it's just down here. And there's a trail, so I don't think we're gonna run into anything. Here, I'll go with you. Up to you. Oh, point it out. Oh well, yeah, I just said not much to look at, just a heavy until a bear stepped in here and there was another one here which I slid on. Heavily used little game trail here, I'll see the black tail and elk and stuff, but that's most definitely a little a little boo-boo. As you can see, the path Shane and I were taking was extremely steep, a common feature in the nest area. What the Olympic Project refers to as the nest area is a much greater swath of land than the immediate vicinity of the many nests found. Instead, the nest area is a network of connected ravines and steep and heavily forested gullies. This combination of factors makes for limited visibility and dangerous terrain. Terrain like Shane and I were walking through now. Ah, kind of sucks though. But no bear took it out. Yeah, see the that sucks. It's probably dead. How many photos? Does that say 70? I can't see that. 13 or 73. So it's still, it was still recording. Let me see real quick. So I don't like to strap them in. Just that, that strap just looks, it stands out. It looks so obvious. So I just like to find a stump. But moving forward, I'm going to be doing less of this kind of camera work. And if you listen, that's that seasonal salmon creek. That's where I want to put cameras is down there. But in the, uh, In the spring, it gets pretty hard because all the foliage, Devil's Club gets so prevalent. It, you know, it's hard to find a good spot to put a camera down there. But the water is where I want to put it near. It covers up smell, covers up sound. The water is a distraction. So by placing the camera down there, if you look at a lot of the, uh, a lot of the surprise sightings on both the human side and the Sasquatch side, in like Roger and Patterson's film, 
it's along a creek bed. So it just makes sense to me that if you want to possibly capture Sasquatch on a camera, your best chance is going to be near a riverbed or creek bed bottom where the water's flowing. Yeah, 74 photos. I guarantee I got a lot of foliage blowing in the wind. Let's see what else I have on here when I check it. I'm just pulling this camera. <laughs> when the Olympic project started in 2008, it began as a camera trap project, using trail cameras hidden away to capture evidence of Sasquatch. However, as the focus of the group has shifted away from that method, they still use trail cameras with that same hope, but in a more limited capacity. But trail cameras also serve another purpose, as we'll see when we arrive in the next camp at a location called NA3. It's my favorite place to camp when we come up here. It gives them the advantage to approaching us. It puts us in a more of a disadvantage. So that's what they like and hopefully they get close. Right. If they're around, they might not even be here. They might have heard us come in yesterday and said, whoop you, and left. <laughs> so why is this called Nest Site 3? Because when I came in here three years ago, we obviously, where the original nests were found, we placed a long-term unit there, and we, I call it Nest Area 1. And then there was a area we tried recording. Actually, when we did the filming of Discovery, we went up to that area, and that was Nest Area 2. But I never recorded anything there, so I just pulled that unit. Everything was further this direction. And then we put a recorder out here, and obviously, Nest Area 3. And then it just kind of exploded into a number of Nest Area. Nest Area 1B, Nest Area 1A, to the point that Todd Hale hates me now. Because it's confusing on your Onyx map with all these labels. And I don't even record in most of the areas that I have these labels now. There was actually a nest area four back that direction. Once again, it proved fruitless. Everything was happening down here by this particular ravine and the ravine that is oh, about 200 yards that way. You have the main ravine coming this way and then this ravine runs into it. But they found the nest in 2020 back on this ravine. At the end, this road dead ends and then there's a trail that goes down to a finger, just like over there. And that's where they walked in on one building a nest. So you call them nest areas, but that doesn't necessarily mean nests have been found here. Correct. It's just because the nests that were found in 2015, it's just, that's why I call it the nest area. It could easily have been, you know, hardcore coursing area <laughs> or something of that nature but yeah so jokes aside we quickly established camp and then headed out into the bush to check on more trail cameras that chris and rebecca had set out what's going on am i crushing anything he's found some impressions do you think it's fair or something else i don't know you got the crush here crush there Crush there. You see it? Do you want us to go in a different way so we can no, check them out? Something's been moving through here frequently. It's just at this angle. I saw this, this, and there. Ah, uh, I just ruined it. That's just, I mean, it's probably nothing. But something's been walking through here. Oh, yeah, it's flattened down up here. Yeah, this, I bet you a bear's been sleeping right there. The last time I was in here, this... Actually, those are probably deer beds right there. There's a bed there. See that, how the ferns this are there? This is fresh down over here, too. Yeah. That's fresh, so that's probably deer beds right there. There's oh. a really big bear that Shane got on camera back here. I think. Last time we were up in July, we found a big pile of bear poop.
I'm looking for brakes, honestly. I'm not... Oh. Ugh. You silk blazing for us? I got cobweb in the beard. Oops. These ones are not quite ripe yet. I got a couple that weren't too bad back then. What's cool about these? We've had them in, up into November. They're ripe. Those huckleberries? Mm -hmm. So this is a red huckleberry? Yeah. It's done. They usually come into season sooner. And they're usually at lower elevations. This is about the elevation you'd normally find a lot of bees. This is an evergreen huckleberry. Here's a little dehydrated one on there, it's still red. Those were really full this year. It's been actually a pretty good berry year. But it's neat seeing these next to each other because they have the same branching style in a way, but they're different. Like these will lose their leaves and this will stay evergreen. And those ones are red and these ones are dark blue. Okay, this is what I was looking for. This one's still growing, but we get, we'll find these little twists. I don't know if you can see it. Twist. Maybe right on the end. They're right just kind of twisted, like something kind of just popped it a little bit. This one, it wasn't complete, so it's still staying green. That one died. You were looking for these twists, why? We will find these sometimes in an area that we go in consistently. And it's almost like something came through where we've put new cameras and everything and it's just kind of marked. We don't we don't know this we're another not sure one? what it means. Yeah, that's an older one. It's hard to tell when they're just little. Um, some of the bigger ones are really interesting because there's no branches that have come down and um well, what would cause down. what would twist something? <laughs> that's the thing, it's not something that other animals do I mean they can break something when they're going through but we're finding it at higher so we'll find this stuff even up higher and it's bigger like this I don't want to break it but it looks like it's just been twisted and popped you know popped and twisted down so one of the things too with all the rain that we're not getting you're gonna have plants are gonna naturally um, like right here this isn't broken but it's dying back because we're not getting any rain. Mm, yes. So plants will just naturally sacrifice some of the leaves on their branch to conserve water. So that's that's why it's a little difficult finding right away what's a break and what's just dead. Like this is kind of broken and dead, but we also have a limb that came down too. So that could have sheared all this off. I'm actually thinking this is from this branch. This is older anyway, but. So you'll see you've got multiples over here, but there's a dead branch came down. So this is officially nest area three where I recorded for the two year project. I had my recorder in this stump. And actually, technically, it was Todd Hale's recorder. It was in the stump and I had moss over it. And it was here for pretty much two years. We'd come in and service it, obviously. Most of the activity happened over in Nest Area 1. That's where the majority of stuff happened. But that way, 500 yards maybe, is where the new nest was found that Todd and Shane walked in on. So that's why this recorder was here. But this is where I had game camera. And I actually, I forgot that I put a game camera out here last time on this stump right here. I had a game camera right here where this bear would walk by every week for months on end and then the minute I changed the batteries in it he came by and walked straight to the camera and picked it up and chewed it up. Oh dang. But I, I'm a glutton for punishment and I totally forgot but back in June I placed a new one in the same spot basically. And this is a kind of cool spot because uh, obviously I got the bear here multiple times, lots of coyote. Lots of deer, and I actually got a bobcat three or four times on this right here. And then Rebecca got a bobcat. She's she's gonna put cameras out now. I'm pulling this because I forgot it was even there. But she got a cool shot of a coyote that kind of sits down on a log 
right in front of her camera. She's got Bobcat too, I think. While obviously the hope of setting up trail cameras is to capture video evidence of Sasquatch, they are useful tools in learning about the other animals that share the environment. From small to large, these animals live in the nest area, and trail cameras provide a window into moments that may never be seen in person. However, the usage of a trail camera does not come without risk. So this is the catwalk game cam area and just came down to service it and noticed that it's been opened. I have yet to check and see if the SD card is in it. I don't know if an animal messed with it or if a person was in here. I don't see anything very evident on it. There are cobwebs here, so it's been, it's not super recent. Okay, SD card's still in there. And it's still on. I'm curious if anything touched it. Oh, it's a bear. Stinking little bear played with it. While this camera remained where Rebecca had put it, not all trail cameras are so lucky. I originally had a cam park like uh, camera back here for what close to two years yeah and then i was so excited to put my stealth cam in that he got me for my birthday and uh, the first time i deployed it so excited came back to change the batteries and a bear had chomped it that's the video i showed you mm. so uh, i'm gonna put it back because it's been dry and that way rain won't get in the holes it's camp park it's 40 bucks on Amazon. Takes good video, takes uh, good photographs. They're cheap. And if a bear chomps it, it's not as big a deal as if it's a hundred and some odd dollar camera. But I've got a number of these. They last pretty long. Um, all the ones that I have are still working except for the ones that have been eaten by bears. just left the uh, strap here because I fed it through under the dirt. Man, it's so yeah. dry in here. I like formatting the card on here.
see how this works. I hate pulling up this moss, but I have to try to get, just kind of break it up a little bit. As long as it's not just standing out. This particular grove where Chris and Rebecca have placed their trail cameras was the scene of a startling encounter. In March of 2022, something happened that may have brought them closer to the target subject than ever before. For the last year and a half, Shane, Rebecca, and I have gone into the nest area repetitively the same way. And we go and service the audio units in the same order every time. And we're just really doing the same thing every time, about once a month. We've suspected we've been noticed before. We have recorded some other vocals and heard vocals while we were there before. Not a lot. Most times we go in, we don't hear anything and nothing happens. And that's pretty much most of the time we go in. And this is actually a good example of a time that something odd happened, but we didn't hear anything that I'm about to play for you. And this is why I always stress to people, if you're going to go out in the field, especially investigating this subject, bring a recorder and turn it on. Turn it on before you get out of your vehicle. We went into the area and Rebecca was servicing her game cameras and I was servicing the LTR, long-term recording unit. And Shane decided to peel off and go set up another game camera in a different area on our back trail. Where are you putting a camera? I'm gonna go down here towards that. You know that, okay. should, there's a stump down there I put them on before. While he was gone, he got back towards where the rig was and he was, you know, he was only 150, 200 yards from us. So he could actually hear me and Rebecca talking. Rebecca was excited. She had a bobcat, I believe, on her game camera that she was telling me about. And from his position, he couldn't see us because the huckleberry is about nine feet tall in this area, but he could hear us. But what he also heard was some large brush movement. And the brush movement, the huckleberry movement, was going towards me and Rebecca. He tried to call me on his cell phone. I didn't answer because my cell phone was on airplane mode. So the battery wouldn't die looking for a signal that it normally doesn't have. When I didn't pick up, he got worried and was because something large was moving through the brush towards us. And he started going back towards the trail to let us know hey, something's moving towards you. In the meantime, I didn't hear any of this. Rebecca had heard the brush movement. I didn't hear any of it. I was in my own little world messing with the recorder and she assumed she was hearing Shane. Anyways, we met Shane halfway on the, on the trail on the way out, and he was all kind of worried. You? No, that big one? Yeah. yeah. That wasn't you. No, that sounded like it came from right down here. That's where I heard it from, but I thought it was you putting no, up, I a... up here by the truck. I just drew my weapon because I'm like, oh crap, they're coming through, and there's something parallel coming right through here somewhere. Could be a bear, but I was like, oh crap, it's not I'm big. an old man. I was oblivious. No, I heard the crack. I just thought it was you pushing something out of your way. I'm trying to hurry you up. I didn't hear it. No, because I was going to put my camera in that usual stump, but all the moss fell off. I said, screw it. So now I'm, I came over here to look. I'm like, ah, screw that. So I went up to the truck and I was going to put it down there and I heard something moving down here. I'm like, that's about five minutes ago. Yeah. So maybe I'll, six now. I'll check my audio. But there's so, if that wasn't you guys, I heard you guys moving down here. Boys, yeah. But there was something bigger moving back here. And I assumed it was you. This is where those whoops came from. Well, that crack was, I mean, it could have been, I guess because we went through here, maybe we touched a tree or something, but it was a, it, it was a pretty, pretty much crack. I couldn't tell if it was something hitting the tree or just a. Pretty much all our suspect audio for January came from here. So we went back and we kind of stuck around and looked around. We didn't see anything. We didn't hear anything else. And went about our day, went over to, uh, nest area one and took care of those uh recorders and the game cameras we had over there and came home well when i got home i started reviewing and sure enough the minute we get out of the rig there's actually a whoop that we didn't hear because me and shane were talking and several minutes later as we're going into the area 
this particular clip happens, there's three vocals. There's a vocal right here. There's a perfect slide whistle loop right here. And there's another loop right here, but that's me moving. We didn't hear any of this, but my recorder picked it up. And that's why you carry a recorder. Moving through the brush, talking, you're going to miss stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and play this clip. Like I said, we didn't hear any of this, and uh, that's why you always, always carry a recorder on your person. This event serves as an example of the fallibility of human senses. While only two people heard the crashing through the brush, not one of them heard the whoops that Chris's recorder captured that day, proving that the quest to discover the Sasquatch's existence has to be a multifaceted approach, one that involves boots on the ground, trail cameras, and audio recorders. In the two years since Shane and Todd Hale walked into a nest being made in NA3, Chris has recorded multiple suspect sounds in the area, like this set of sounds from January of 2022. The audio captured at NA3, in combination with the audio presented in the previous episode, paints a compelling picture of a Sasquatch that moves from ravine to ravine in search of food within the Greater Nest area. A track find in November of 2021 in an area called NA4 helps to more concretely define this image. Okay, check this out. This is right on the side of the road where all these huckleberry, huckleberry breaks are. And this is 17 inches. I'm gonna scan it. We just took pictures with a tape, but it's massive. And it's stomped down about three inches in that mud. So we found an impression over this way where there's a bunch of huckleberry breaks and it's also 17 inches. Have you measured these over here? Yeah. There's impressions over here. How long are those? About the same, about 17. Again, you got impressions over here. Huckleberry breaks, 17 inches. The 17 inch track seen here in Todd's 3D scan was several inches deep in an area surrounded by broken huckleberry branches. Okay, so the guys are coming through here, but they didn't do this. So we have broken huckleberry on both sides of the road. Like, I would say we can't say it's Bigfoot, but it's either human or Bigfoot. This isn't bear ugly behavior. Oh, it's just broke off and dropped. This stuff wasn't here last week, so this is new. Broke, pulled, broke. Yeah, and this is the material the nests were made out of. Obviously, this is not being transported anywhere, but I think it's just broke and it's not necessarily dropped right where the uh, branch is broken, but in the general area, like it was held for a while. Okay, so here's one that's broken. And for whatever reason, 
wasn't taken. That almost looks like it was ripped out of the ground. Broke off. Yeah. You got ones down low and ones up tall. It's like a troop came through here. Possibly. Here's another incomplete mm -hmm. break. I can't focus with a GoPro like I can other ones. Let's twist it around. You got this big one right here. Yeah. That is not something... I mean, look how high up it is. Look, the tops of those are all broke off. Those are over six foot up. Six and a half feet up. Look at that big one up there. That one's broke off. That's like seven foot right up right there. That's, that's just doesn't make sense. A human's not doing that. I don't see a human walking in this anyways. Okay, so this one's broken. Eh, that's about my height. I'd say about five foot. The realization of what these breaks could imply is caught on the Olympic Project's cameras. Interesting to note that even though they're all kind of broken down about the same height, they're not really going after the rhododendrons. So if they were clearing these just so that they had a clear view, they would probably also be taking down the rhododendrons, but it seems like they're going solely after the huckleberry. Look at the trail. Look at it. It's littered with huckleberry. Just looking at the trail. Yeah. You don't even have to... They're stripping the berries off it. Dude, look at this. Look at this. Beautiful berries. Yep. Mmm. <laughs> just like that. Just grab the branch, put your mouth on it. Rip it. Mmm. Just like that. That's what they're doing. I almost... And all these... All of these branches that have been broke off and laying on the ground, not one of them has a berry on them. Every single one of them is lacking berries. I'm strongly leaning to that. They are, this is evidence of them grazing on the berries. See, look how loaded this plant is. It's November and these things are good through almost through December, I know that much. And see, that's what all these are like back here. And the ones that are broke off have none. These berries are actually really delicious right now. Not as big as they usually are. We had dry summer, but yeah. November, huckleberries are in season. The presence of berries demonstrates that there is a viable food source for a large animal in the nest area. Other great apes, like gorillas, have been observed to eat berries and other nutrient-rich resources, leaving behind stripped leaves, much like the Olympic Project was finding. In a location like the nest area, where human presence is minimal, spots like this might never be noticed by anyone. In addition to the evergreen huckleberries, there are also red huckleberries, blackberries, and salau berries. All these berries are ripe in different seasons throughout the year, providing a plentiful food source for many animals. Yeah, that's, oh, this is actually edible, by the way. So this is something, well, no, I'm not gonna. What I'm saying is, is that this is something that they could eat. I'm gonna throw this down in the ravine. Which is better? We're following uh, huckleberry breaks from up in here. There's a bunch up here. There's a path right here. It's really steep down into this ravine. There's a creek down there, obviously. Obviously, an animal the size of a Sasquatch could not subsist off of berries alone probably needing a more protein-rich food source, something exactly like what the streams in the nest area contain.
The assumption that Sasquatch eats meat is not necessarily the most obvious one. After all, the other great apes, like gorillas, subsist off a diet of fruit and leaves, and they get enough protein from their diet to live that way. But the secret to the gorilla muscular physique on a vegetarian diet lies in the way their bodies digest the leaves they eat. Gorillas have extra long intestines that ferment the leaves, creating bacteria which is then broken down by their bodies. This bacteria generates more than enough protein for even the large silverbacks to live off of, a process which human beings are physically incapable of. Most other great apes subsist off mostly vegetarian diets as well, although some orangutans and chimpanzees have been observed to hunt monkeys and eat them. However, it doesn't seem to be a large part of their diet. The Sasquatch's dietary habits remains mostly in the speculative realm of whether they have a gut that can ferment leaves or if they need to get their protein externally. Throughout the past few decades, there have been reports of Sasquatches eating squirrels, clams, fish, as well as berries, leaves, and other plants, suggesting an omnivorous diet similar to a bear. There is even some evidence to suggest that Sasquatch goes for larger animals like deer, from several eyewitness testimonies claiming to have seen Sasquatch in action. Typically, Sasquatch is thought to be an ambush predator, meaning that they strike at close range and kill their prey, usually breaking its neck or back. Most kills associated with Sasquatch are absent of bite marks, claw marks, bullet holes, arrow wounds, or anything that would suggest a different type of predation. Most of the time these kills are torn open, with many of the internal organs missing. When the pieces are put together, it portrays a compelling image of a large omnivorous animal in the Pacific Northwest. And like many animals in the PNW, the idea of a Sasquatch traveling over ridges to get to different salmon-bearing streams is not at all far-fetched. This trail camera, set high up on a ridge, managed to capture an otter, making the trek to climb over the ridge and down the other side. This rarely observed behavior is a prime example of how learning about the surrounding wildlife can provide clues to the behavior of Sasquatch. She's hiding now. <laughs> yeah, it's that. amazing how many rocks end up in the truck that I never knew were there. And it's like they're magic rocks. That's I saw that rock. I was like, what's Oh, she put a oh there she put another rock in the truck. That's what the subject came. Okay. okay. Who likes collecting rocks? You do? The lovely Rebecca is a rock collector. She's a rock. Yeah, I'll, I'll be in my truck and then where'd Rebecca go? Oh, I don't know. Here she comes with a rock. Not small rocks. No, no, and there's sometimes they're like big rocks. Pole. One time we were hiking down it's like the in, in the valley, the um, last zone valley of Mount St. Helens. And it's, you know, it's a three, four mile hike down and then you gotta go straight uphill. It's a three mile hike straight uphill. It's not, it's not hard, but it's, you're worn out when you're done. We're down there and she's eyeballing this rock about this big. <laughs> and I look at her, I go, I'm not packing that and you're not bringing that out of the valley. And she just gave me this look and she packed it by herself out of the valley just to spite me. The yeah, there's also a collection of rocks from this area, <laughs> from several other research areas in the backyard. Nice. It's kind of cool though, because we go back to, oh yeah, that's from that, that camp out. You remember that camp out? She remembers it better than I do. Yeah. You like collecting rocks? <laughs> well, he just talked about rocks. He didn't talk about pine cones and you collect all kinds of things. <laughs> there's a, there's a couple like rocks in my bedroom right now with moss on them that she mists every so often from her Alaskan trip. Oh, yeah? Yeah, she's got Alaskan moss and rocks. So you got lichen, moss. In my bedroom. <laughs> 
It's like Rainforest Cafe, baby. <laughs> so, like, this is one of the recording units. It's a Olympus uh, DM720. It has a time record function. I, I have, like, the one I carry is another Olympus. Um, they're just, they get good quality audio. Um, and I'm pretty sure... I, mean, I know there's other recorders out there that have time record functions, but this is kind of the most affordable and quality audio. And it's just, once you start using one, you just kind of get stuck because you know it. I, it took me forever to learn all the functions. And believe me, there was a lot of cursing when I'd go on the field and the dang thing didn't turn on because I didn't know how to set it. Make sure the time and date is right. Definitely not seven in the morning. Mm. Mics are working. All right, good to go. Back in March, I was. Yeah, it was March. I was sitting at the campfire in my chair looking this way. And I see this old tree doing this back here. And then it crashes to the ground. Oh, jeez. Me and Shane found it. There's nothing around it. I mean, it's just kind of odd. Kind of tripped me out. I was all by myself. I was about to eat a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> and, then, huh. and that's kind of a thing. Tree falls. Um, yes, some of them are probably perfectly natural, but pretty sure some of them uh, are pushovers. Yeah, I'm not really trying to hide it. If I was putting it out here for a long period of time, I would I would find a stump that I could hollow out and I'd stick the unit actually in the stump and then have the mics clipped out and cover it with moss and stuff. I'm not really caring right now. <laughs> if I was setting a long term out here, I would note which mic is which, which you can do by looking at the recorder. Actually, I'll just do it right now. So. <laughs> And it turned off. Good thing I checked. You can cut this part out. <laughs> <laughs> it's 113 now. And so that's the left mic. Left mic is pointing west. Right mic is going north. So when I review Inspectogram, I know my left mic's pointed southwest, my right mic's pointed kind of northwest. So cool. if something's obviously hitting harder here, we know they're coming from that direction. If something's hitting harder over there, we know it's coming from that direction. With the audio recorder placed, Chris, Rebecca, and I headed out to go check on the time-lapse camera. Yeah, there's recently dug on this stuff right here. See, that's been dug into within the last couple weeks. So that's bare. I to point out, this is natural. This happens in storms, but there's a yeah. lot of, that gets, that gets called Bigfoot activity a lot. Where it falls. Big in. branches and sticks stuck in the ground. See, these are all cottonwood and alder. And as they get bigger, they rot out, and in a storm, branches break out off, and they fall to the ground, and they stick down into the ground up to feet. And, yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, nature's terrifying sometimes. <laughs> I've never pitched a tent in an alder patch. Yeah. Why? Because if the wind picks up, you're likely to wake up with a tree on top of you. Alder and cottonwood are notorious for falling down. I'm not an expert on the trees, but um, a lot of times after a company logs an area, anywhere where there's like marshes, like you could go on Google Earth, if you want to find marshes, look for 
deciduous tree patches. You'll see patches of deciduous trees among the conifers. Well, there's going to be a freshwater spring there or a marsh because cottonwoods and alders suck a lot of water. They're always going to be growing next to marshes. And this area is usually really marshy. Alders will grow pretty easily in a in a newly logged area. Too. Yeah, you, you'll, a lot of times you'll see tons of alders along logging roads and such. I'm going to grow like weeds, but... As you can see, there's not a lot of views around here. This is one view where I had kind of, this little side ravine runs down into the main ravine. So I put this time-lapse, it's a Do Dosen camera running down this way. I have it hooked up on that solar panel there. And I had it set to uh, a picture every three seconds from sunrise to about eight in the morning and then from 8 p.m. to sunset. Actually, I had it set to 7 p.m. Most I've gotten out of it was 14 or 15 um, days, but I haven't checked it in a while. I'm actually gonna pull it out of here. Boy. It does better in the summertime, wintertime. It does really bad because <laughs> you get snow. We had a lot of snow this year up here. I mean, everything blanketed. So the solar panel gets blanketed by snow and then you don't have any more power. The purpose of using a time-lapse camera rather than a regular trail camera is that a time-lapse camera does not have to be triggered in order to record. Most trail cameras are motion activated, meaning that when something passes in front of the camera within a close enough range to be detected, it will record. Most of the time, things have to be relatively close to the camera in order to activate it making it blind to the things that may be in the field of view, but out of the range of the motion detector. The time-lapse camera records for several seconds at a time, going every three seconds, capturing whatever comes through the field of view. The hope is that if a Sasquatch passes in front of it, it will be captured, even if it's far away. And I'm just actually very thankful to see it's here has full power and not been eaten by a bear. Usually if a camera survives its first couple months out here and you don't touch it, the bears aren't gonna mess with it because your scent's gone anyways. The scents that they're gonna pick up on are food scents, so if you're placing cameras, just make sure you don't eat before you place them for one, and then make sure your hands are scent free when you do place them. Looks pretty cool. <laughs> what is what's going on here? Peleated woodpeckers. They're those ones that get about that big. Wait, how big? They're like that long on a tree. When they're up there. That's huge. Yeah, they're a big bird. That's uh some of the knocks that people report are actually those because it'll sound like a single knock or a couple knocks, and they're testing to find where the spots are in the tree with the larva. And so they'll just be tapping around and some of them can sound really, really loud. And then usually if you stick around long enough or you've recorded it long enough, you can end up hearing one of those um, either banging on the tree or you'll hear their call. So they get, they get blamed for a lot of stuff. Not everything, but if you dig into it sometimes you can find out, oh, it's a woodpecker. <laughs> the sounds of the forest can be deceiving especially when one is not familiar with them. The peleated woodpecker, the largest woodpecker in North America, uses its beak to eat bugs hidden in trees. The resulting sounds made by its eating habits can sound very close to what people call a Sasquatch knock.
However, when compared to a genuine Sasquatch knock, the difference is audible. Additionally, owls can make vocalizations that sound incredibly similar to a Sasquatch, making the possibility of misidentification more likely. However, as Chris will demonstrate, there are differences, and by reviewing the audio, both by listening closely and looking at it visually, you can make out those differences. Now this is a clip, and I've talked about it before, in March while servicing audio in Nest Area 3, where actually this particular owl vocalization came from the same area. But I wanted to just show you the comparison. So this is the fundamental, and you can see it's starting down low in the 300s, and it's, it's only peaking just below 500 hertz here. Hertz are over here. And I know I say hertz don't matter, but in this case it does. <laughs> this is the barred owl. It's starting out up in the 700s and it's peaking up to a thousand. This is the barred owl scream. And you notice how long the barred owl scream is and how flat this is. So it, it's, it's shaped different. It has a similar look. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it and you haven't seen a lot of it, it it's I can totally get it how someone would think it might be a Bigfoot if it's distant, especially if they don't do this other vocal. And that happens a lot. And so I'm not blaming anybody. That's why I'm showing it to you and I'm, I'm hopefully helping some people out here. But I'll go ahead and play this and you'll hear a definite difference in tone and pitch and what it actually sounds like. As a researcher, one should be able to discern the differences between the sounds of known animals and the sounds of the target subject to better cultivate an evidence base and present the most convincing data possible for the existence of Sasquatch. Oh, here it is. With the time-lapse camera in hand, Chris, Rebecca, and I trekked back to camp. But Chris was eager to take us on a detour to show us the results of a tree fall he had witnessed. You watched a tree fall when? Remember I told you I saw that tree doing this and then fell over? When did you tell me that? Well, I just got here. Oh, see, I don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was back in March. This past March? Yeah. This guy right here. It fell down and you had two pieces here and I just saw the top of one but I just saw the top of it kind of shimmying and then boom bam bam and this was all fresh when me and Shane came back and we wanted to find it so where were you standing you know where our camp is yeah I was sitting looking this direction getting ready to eat a grilled cheese sandwich because it was about one in the afternoon. There was a little wind earlier, but at the time it was calm. And that was the same day that later on that evening when I was sitting in camp again, something got crashed in the huckleberry right behind me. I told you about that. There was just some unusualness going on and this tree obviously was dead and it might've just finally decided it was time to fall. But, you know, there's other times where when you have like 
three or four tree falls within the same hour and you get something large yelling and screaming plus you get wood knocks then the tree falls become a little more suspect so well i'm at the top so that's probably oh 50 plus feet a little over 50 feet close by we found something even more interesting that hit that was pulled broke down that's newer well i'm saying that's live yeah this tree's still alive this tree's still alive and when we were walking under that i noticed the needles were dead and falling off it's just that's sap dripping kind of interesting honestly because i'm not seeing where something fell on it another tree didn't fall on it that's been pole broke down that's actually do you want me to stand notable. on the height scale? It's got to be old enough that... It's been a while, but let that's... Let me stand under it. So I'm 5'5". Five five. You know, it's funny. This is this is about where, when in March, when me and Todd were in camp, we heard a huge crack. There was a huge branch break after Shane had left. It's brittle. And that's what I would expect. That's funny. It's brittle. What does that mean? This is brittle. It's not... It. it there's sap. There's still sap, which means this part's alive. But this is brittle and dead where it was broken. So if it was broken alive, it's old enough that this has had time to dry and weather. So, huh. I don't, so it it would have been alive when it was broken because the needles are dying. Right. There. Well, the the way that they've dropped there. You can tell that's not rotted out. That's living wood that got broke. It's old. It's probably several months old. That's yeah. why I mean I'm thinking about that huge branch break that me and Todd heard and this would kind of fit the uh, expectation. I mean there's no what would cause that something pole broke that down that's not because it got old and just fell over and broke that's living wood that got broken and I'm not seeing a tree fall right here right I can't say it's Bigfoot but that's very very suspicious <laughs> Sorry for repeating myself, but you can tell by looking at the inside of it. That's not rotted wood. This, when this was broken, this was alive. Or not very, because that's what live wood does. It splinters like that's that. That's like a, a stress tear as yeah. opposed to just breaking off from being dead. Cool. Actually, that's more impressive to me than that tree over there that I watched fall. Well, because that one back there is already dead, dead. <laughs> Something with force broke that, and that's... I don't have my tape, but... I have... That's not a branch one of us could just break. Mm. Yeah, just right Probably below right it. Probably about there. Yeah. Come around your way so you can... So it's an eight and a half circumference. Just put the tape straight across and we'll get a just a guesstimate on the diameter, so three inches. The significance of the tree breaks and possibly a tree push down may indicate that Sasquatch engages in territorial displays, either as a way to mark their territory or to intimidate unwelcome visitors away from it, a trait common amongst the great apes. It is important to learn about the natural world and try to figure out how Sasquatch might fit in it. In the following episode, we'll be taking a look at other similarities between the Sasquatch and the Great Apes, as well as delving into more of the reasons why the Olympic Project does what they do, and exploring whether fear is something that holds them back or if their desire for answers pushes them further along the road to discovery.